Wayne County is now in session. The Honorable Lou Dayich presiding. Okay, thank you. Be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the May 1st edition of the uh, mock trial proceedings today. Um, just thanks for coming, participating. Um, the rest of you know why we're here. We're here on a defendant's motion to suppress evidence, as I understand it, uh, from a uh, uh, lineup circumstance. And uh, with the, you all over the government side, right? Why don't you introduce yourself, give me the role that you're, you're playing, and then just let me know who, you're, who you expect to call the witness, all right? Go ahead. Well, my name is Colin Rebel. I'll be playing part of attorney one. Isaac Casey will be attorney two, and our witness, Noah Crooks, will be Amber Bird. Okay. Defendant. I'll wait a second. And uh, you can just go ahead and introduce. What's your co counsel's name? Isaac Casey. Isaac Casey. Isaac what? Casey. Okay. And then what role does Ms. Bird play? The witness, Noah Crooks. And what is what is her role? Is she a police officer or? She's a detective. Detective? That's the only witness you're going to call? Yes. Okay. Ready to go? That's ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Call your first witness. He needs to explain the nature of the case. Okay, go ahead. The defendant alleged that the out of court identification should be suppressed because the administration of the photo array used to identify it was unnecessary suggestive, and that the identification made by Lester customer should be thrown out. It is a commonwealth's intent to prove the administration of the photo array was unnecessary suggestive, and identification is unnecessary. Wait, say your last couple sentences again. Your con the intention of the Commonwealth is to prove what? To prove that the administration of the photo array was not, not unnecessarily suggestive and identification is admissible. Okay, so you're prepared to do that? Yes. All right, is there something else preliminary to that, Mr. Chess, you're ready to roll? Yes, sir. Okay, you can call your first witness then. Commonwealth would like to call our first witness, Detective Noah Kirst, to stand up. Come on up, I think you're going to be sworn with the fake bail here. <laughs> and then we'll. Which I would stand. Worst things I can do. Mm -hmm. If this were a real case, would you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, everybody who's participating, keep your voice up. Have a seat, please. And uh, go ahead and start. Please. Victor Crooks, if you could please state your name and rank for the court. I am Noah Crooks, that's C R O O K S, and I'm a detective for the Wayne Police Department. Okay, Detective Crooks, and how long have you been involved in law enforcement? I started out as a police officer in 2006, and I became a detective in 2010. Very good. And from that law enforcement, what kind of trainings or certifications do you hold? Um, I have the Municipal Police Officer Education Training Commission. It's a basic law enforcement academy. I can't see you. I'm sorry. Can you move to the podium? I can't see you in the video. Sure. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. So I guess a few. From now on, for the videographer, when you all address the court, just come up to the podium and make you, make you more uncomfortable that way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And so now, I'm sorry. Go ahead and start with your okay. question again. So, did you administer the photo array to Buster Customer, who was a witness, on March 4th, 2014? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and how did you become involved in the administration of this photo array? I was approached by Officer Barney Fife and asked to be the administrator for the lineup. And how many photo arrays have you done in your career? A little over 150. Okay, so can you please explain what happened when Buster Customer first arrived at the police station? I led him in to the, to the um, interrogation room. I introduced myself, and then I had him sit down at a table. Okay, and what, about what time did he arrive? About 10.30, we arrived a.m. So after he arrived, you sat him down, correct? Yes. Okay, and what did you do after that? I made sure he was as comfortable as possible. I explained the procedure, and then I had him sign the procedure explanation form. Okay, can you explain what is included in the procedure explanation form? What kind of process that involves? Um, I informed him of what was going to go on within the photo lineup, that he would be shown a, a series of photographs, and to know that he may see the person, but the person may be altered in some way by facial hair, hair color change, or clothing change. And that if at any point in the photo array, if they recognize somebody, to let me know whether they're an acquaintance or not. 
not just that they're the suspect, but if they are personally friends with him. Okay. So after you explained it, he, he signed it, correct? Yes, he so, did. So he showed that he understood all the things that you were outlining to him? Yes. Okay. So after you had him sign the form, what happened next? I uh, described to him what was happening during the lineup. Okay. I then um, had him, I then told him that at any point in the photo array that he could tell me to go next. I wouldn't go next until all the photos were displayed, and then if he wanted me to, I could go back through my dad. Okay. Did he um, did he go through? So he went through all the all the pictures. Yes, he did. And he did that all before he made an identification. Yes. Okay. How many times did he go through? Was it like two, three times? Did he? He went through first twice. Okay. Just to reassure himself. Very good. I'm gonna say, may I approach the witness? Yes, sir. Please take a look at these and tell tell us what those are. These are the photographs that I displayed during the lineup. Okay. They're the exact photos. None of them have been altered or changed. Okay. And they're numbered. Yes, they are. And they're numbered the same way that they were as they appeared in the lineup. Yes. Yes, they are. Judge, just for the court's benefit, this is a criminal procedure class and not an evidence class, so the the rules of evidence and the the courtroom technique is relaxed. Okay, that's fine. You're doing fine. <clears throat> I think what she means by that is you don't have to mark all these. Okay. Things, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's perfect. Okay, thanks. Do you need a copy? Sure. sure. Like, I think Mr. Chess might want to see them. Yeah. Sure, that's kind of thing. Do you have a copy? I do. Thank okay. you. Okay. Hey, okay. good. Okay. So after he saw these photos, was he was your customer able to make an identification? Yes, he was. Okay. And which photo did he choose? He identified photo number six. Okay. Now, were you aware of if this photo was a suspect or not? No, I was not. It was a double blind procedure. Can you explain that, please? I did. I went through an, an, another officer who told me who made up the array. I did not physically make up the photos. He just gave me the slideshow on the presentation and I displayed them for the for the witness. So you didn't you didn't have anything to do with making the lineup no. or arranging all that? Okay. No. And you didn't know anyone who were in the slides? No, I did not. Okay. So after Buster Customer made the identification, what did you have him do after that? After he filled out the identification form. Okay, and can you explain what that is and what it does? It just states that he had identified the um, he had identified the person that he thought was a suspect, and then also he filled out another form stating how confident he was. And do you know how confident he said he was? He was 100% certain, I would say. Very good. Was there anything else that you did? For him during this time? Um, in the beginning, he seemed a little nervous whenever I brought him in. And so to, it's my job as a photo array administrator to make him feel comfortable. So I patted his hand lately. And then after it was all said and done, I escorted him out and I thanked him for his participation. Okay. What, at what point during the lineup did you pat his hand and consult him a little bit? I did it before. I displayed the photo, the photo array, just to make sure that he wasn't nervous and that he didn't feel as if he had to make a, he had to choose a suspect. Okay. And did he feel relaxed? Did he seem to kind of relax a little bit after this? Yes, he did. Did okay. Did you just pat his hand, or were there was there anything else you did, said, anything like that? I patted his hand and just said, "It's okay. You can choose who you want to. You don't have to make a." choose a suspect because our investigation will still go on. So, and then what did you do after busting? So you said you escorted him out. What did yes. you do after you left? I then um, told Barney Fife what went on and told him and gave him the paperwork and told him that he did indeed identify, well he didn't identify the person but he did make a, um, he did make a selection out of the that it was number six. Okay. 
And all the forms that you filled out, do they stay with, or do you turn them into him? I turn them into Mark. Okay. I don't hold them myself. This isn't my investigation. I just do the photo, right? Okay, so it's not your, but, so Officer Fife was the original investigating yes. officer. Yes, Okay, and just to, just to be clear, he's the one that arranged all this. Yes. And you just administered it. Correct. Okay. Yeah, no further questions. Okay, and come on. I'm sorry, defense. Thank questions, please. Yes. Can I see what you're talking about? You're obviously looking at documents during your testimony. I was just yes. wondering if I could see what they are. There's documents you're looking at is Reed's techniques and nine yes. steps of interrogation? Yes. Okay. That was just in case you anybody wanted to know exactly what it was. Okay, well we're here on a item. So let me ask you, um, you said you greeted uh, the uh, gentleman at the door. Is that correct? Yes. The police station? Yes, I did. So not the investigating officer? No. You've never met well, him before? Yeah, who? you well, never met the man making the identification? No, I have not. Never because met him before, but you, but you met him at the door. How'd you meet a guy you never met before? Well, I met Barney Fife. Barney Fife was standing there with him. Sorry, I didn't clarify that. Okay, so the investigating officer on the case who put the array together yes. was with you, and you two met. Yes, and then I took him to the to the sorry, interrogation room, and I displayed the photo. I took him to the staff. And did he know why he was there? Yes, he did. In Barney Fife, uh, Officer Barney Fife made that clear. In your presence? Not in my presence. So you don't know what, what Officer Fife said to him about No, I don't. You don't know if he told him, you're here for a lineup on this homicide case, and I'm going to tell you which number it is. Correct. You have no idea? Right. Okay. So, but you, obviously he knew it was important. Yes. The gentleman knew it was important. Yes, it was the officer's Okay. And, uh, you said that he signed a form afterwards saying that he felt confident yes. in the selection. Can you tell me where that form is? I haven't seen it. He has, the, my attorney has the form. Okay. I can have this for you. Let's see. Thank you. Yes. This is the form you testified about? Yes. Yes, that is. Okay, he signed that here. Yes. Okay. That's his writing. And that's your signature? Yes. Now, you said that you have, in your training, and you said that you've uh, been a detective for four years, 2010? Yes. Okay. And you've done 150 photographs. Oh, properly. I didn't count all of them, but yeah. Since 2010? About, yes. Okay. So, help me. 35 a year? It's. I can't tell you an exact number. On average, I mean, 150, four years. That's about right, about like 35, 40 a year. Okay. And have you had any training in giving my Yes. Okay. And what did that training tell you about uh, how important it is that they not be suggested? It, it made it perfectly clear that to not be suggested, because then my evidence, their witness testimony can be thrown out. And how long have you worked with Officer Fife? With him? Yes. I'd say about five years. Okay, so the whole time you've been a detective? Yes. Okay, and so in, in your cases, um, you have a photo array. Does he administer for you? Does he administer them for me? No. No? No, I'm the, okay, I'm, I don't do investigation cases. I just do the administering of the photo array. Okay, so you've done many for Officer Fife. I would say, but not just for him, but yes. Okay, so you have a relationship with him, and have a history of doing, uh, conducting these with him. Yes. How many have you conducted with Officer Fife's cases? I've probably do, done about three-fourths overall of, of the case, of the photo arrays I've done were his, I would say. So over 100? Yes. Of your photo array that you've administered have been from Officer Fife? Yes. Okay. Is it always your practice to let him introduce uh, the, 
individual who's reviewing the arrays and talk to him before you get a chance to talk to him? Yes, because he is he knows him. He doesn't know me. He's never seen me before. So he's there to make sure that he, he's getting where he needs to be. And you never listen in to see if Officer Fife told him, who created the array, right. told him which one to pick? No. You have no idea? No. Now, in all your training, how much training have you had on photo arrays? My training would be about, about six months or so, to maybe a year. I don't know the exact amount, I'm sorry. No, but you've been to several trainings. Yes. And they told you to make sure it's not a newly suggested, unnecessarily yes. suggested. And they told you never touch the individual, right? Yes. But yet you did it here. Just to calm him. He seemed Just so nervous, him. and I didn't want him to seem like he had to make a choice. Okay. Because so, as you said, I don't know what Officer Barney Fife said to him, so I just wanted to make him calm or laugh, not feel any pressure. Okay. So, but you've been told never touch him. Yes. Okay, because you could be giving him signals, right? Yes, but I did not do it during the time of the photo, right? Whenever the photos were being displayed. That's not my question. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, my question to you is you've been told not to touch them. Yes. Right? And you did it anyway. You violated your training. Yes. Okay. And uh, how many, and you've done another 150 of these? Yes. Is that typical for you to, to go ahead and, and touch them? It's not typical, no. How often have you done it 150 times? I've maybe done it about 20 times. Okay. So 20 out of 150, one eight times fairly, you violate the training. Yes. Okay. And you do it routinely. It's obviously okay. Do it that frequently. You're, you're familiar with the Wayne Police Department policy, correct? And it doesn't tell you in there, go ahead and, and violate your training. Does it? it doesn't tell you, go ahead and, and touch their hand. It tells you, make sure that it's not unduly suggestive, right? Yes. Really not a surprise uh, that Mr. Customer was shaken or upset, uh, anxious right. about this. It's a homicide case, right? Yes. And it's important. Yes. He certainly knew it's important. Certainly, Officer Fife told him, among other things, that we don't know that it was important. Yes. And you took it upon yourself to pat him on the hand. Yes. And in violation of all your training. Yes. Okay. Anything else in your training that you violated that you like to tell the court since you're on your own? No, I have not. Everything else you did by the book? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No okay. questions? Thank you, Mr. Chief. Um, any follow up at all? Certainly. Okay. So, um, as you stated before, during the procedure of the lineup, not necessarily before or after, but during the procedure, you didn't touch Buster Customer's hand, correct? Yes. And again, that took at which that took place at what point during the procedure? It was right before I was about. To, it was. It was as I was filling out a form. Okay, so no photos had been. No shown. photos were seen. He had no idea who was in the photos. Okay. Now, also, can you explain how the uh, double blind identification works again? This is in your procedures, right? As outlined by the Waney Police Department. It basically just says that I have no knowledge of who the suspect is. I am just handed the photo array and showed, told to display them and have the, um, the witness to sign the forms. That's all I am to do. All right. You want to back up? Yeah. Yeah, come back up again. I forgot about that part. Please. We have the audio, you can just You're continue right. where you are. Sir. Go ahead, please. Now, to your knowledge, does it say anywhere in the policy that, does it tell you anything about touching the person in, some, in the Wayne Police Department policy? Not from my knowledge, it just says not to be suggested. Okay. And you had no knowledge of who the subject was, right? No, no knowledge. To me, they were all just innocent people. People in my eye. Okay. And just to be clear, towards the beginning, when you first met uh, Buster Customer, and he was he was so he was met by Officer Fife, correct? Okay. 
So did Officer Fife escort him into the building? Did, or did you come out and meet them and escort him in? How did that work? Well, Barney Fife didn't escort him into the bill, like into the police department. He bust her customer, walked himself in, and then Officer Barney Fife met him there. And then he introduced? Yes, and I was told exactly what time to be there, and I was at the place at 10.30 to okay. meet up with Buster Customer, take okay. him back. If you don't make a, an identification here, don't worry about it, the investigation's going to go on, right? Yes. That was a quote. Uh, but yet you know nothing about the case, correct? Correct. Okay, so, but yet you feel compelled to tell him, I don't know anything about the case, but don't worry about it. Even if you're here, don't make a, an identification, the investigation's going to go on. Yeah, so he didn't feel pressure to choose somebody that was not the best friend. But the fact is you lied to him, because you really don't know anything about the investigation, do you? No, I don't, but it's just... It could have hinged upon that, right? It could have, but... Rather than making a bad, a bad choosing a bad, choosing someone who's not the suspect is my worry. That your worry is choosing someone who's not the suspect. I'm sorry. Can I rephrase that? Please. Choosing somebody. To my knowledge, I just want. I don't necessarily need him to choose someone. Is my main thing. He doesn't have to. If he feels that there's there the suspect is not up there, then that's up to him. Okay. But it's not up to me. I just want him to choose the right decision. I just want to make sure that he doesn't he doesn't feel obligated to choose someone. And, and you testified to that. Yeah. But that has nothing to do about whether or not the investigation went on, does it? No. In fact, you don't know. Correct. Because you, you don't know anything about the investigation. At least so you testified. Correct. Okay. And nothing in your policy tells you to tell him. Don't worry about it. The investigation's going to go on. Correct. And nothing in your training tells you. Tell them, don't worry about what you do here. The investigation will still go on. Thank you. Anything else, sir? No, thank you. Okay. So you may step down, and um, she have an opportunity to close. Close? Okay. Let's do that. Your Honor, the Commonwealth argues that the out of court identification should not be suppressed because the photo array was not unnecessary suggestive. Detective Crooks testified that the procedure was a double blind and that he had no knowledge at the time of the procedure who the suspect was. Buster Customer showed that he was nervous and Detective Crooks wanted to consult him. Through the totality of circumstances, Detective Crooks wanted to make sure there was no pressure on Mr. On Mr. Customer to choose one of the photos. Under the totality of the circumstances concealing Mr. Customer was the best thing to do at the time. Because neither the procedure nor Detective Crook's actions were necessarily suggestive, customer's identification of the suspect is admissible. Additionally, according to Manson v. Bradlife, the Supreme Court found the totality of circumstances test and held, them, held that the unnecessary and suggestive photographic identification procedure was reliable and therefore admissible. Okay. Let me ask you a couple questions. Do you have any concern about the fact that on cross-examination, uh, Detective Crooks indicated that she violated a policy of the department? Is that cause for concern? It can't be. Okay. And how about the fact that you make, she makes a big point of this, the fact that it's supposed to be a double blind study, or double blind with the, I guess the suggestion being that Fife and the person who was making the identification were not sort of in cahoots, right? Does it concern you at all that they had, Fife and the Buster customer had conversation prior to the lineup? I think it's something they should, might want to address. Would it, would it not have been better if there was no conversation between Fife and um, Buster Customer? Yes, I guess so. Okay. Mr. Jess? Nothing else? Okay. Um, court has expressed some concerns about the, um, the admissibility of evidence, but uh, the trial's a long way off, so we'll make a ruling at a later date and take the matter under advisement. All right? So we'll be in adjournment. Is the second group three ready to start then? I think so.
Mr. Just has a motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, based upon the way the evidence came out of the suppression hearing, I asked that uh, you consider the reduction uh, in the bail on my client. Uh, your motion tonight. <laughs> the prosecution may have something to argue. Do you want to argue about bail? I'll, I'll consider potentially reducing his bail. Do you want to argue against it? Yes, Your Honor. Go ahead. We would like to say that due to the nature of the crime that was committed by the defendant, uh, as we know, it was an armed robbery that turned into a murder. Um, this would indicate that he has a propensity to be involved with violent crime. And so in order to effectively protect the community of Whitey and all around, uh, we ask that his bail not be reduced. Well, maybe I jumped the gun, but given the seriousness of the offense, it being still a charge of general homicide along with other charges, your, your motion to reduce bail is tonight. Thank bail will remain the same. Okay, thank you. All right, folks, I recognize a lot of you as former students and uh, won't pretend to remember everyone's name. So I do know who you are, though, but, but for our purposes, if you all are ready, this is a, um, a motion before the court uh, on the defendant's motion to um, express evidence found as a result of a search, a vehicle search which the defendant alleges was without probable cause and has other reasons without consent, other reasons to suppress the evidence. So we're going to have one of you can step up to the podium, introduce both yourself and the other person, tell me as the court who you expect to call as a witness. Um, anytime you address, you know, your witness or what have you, anytime that you're speaking, we'll come up here so we can get you on camera. Are you ready to go, Mr. Yeah. Chair? All right, come on up. Introduce yourselves and, and your cohort to cohort today, and we'll go from there. Mr. Jess, you ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Your Honor, my name is Nathan Merkel. I will be playing the part of Attorney One. Okay. But the part of Attorney Two is Katie. The Economist, and then playing our witness, Deputy Dog, is Paula Shinko. The defendant alleges that the evidence... Just, just one second. I don't think I know. You said Shinko? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. The defendant alleges that the evidence seized from its vehicle during a non-consensual search and warrantless search should be suppressed because the dog alert did not provide probable cause to the search of the vehicle. The defendant challenges the quality of training, certification, and performance in the field. Specifically, the defendant alleges that the canine certifications were expired and the dog alerted where there were no drugs, and that an incomplete record of performance in traffic stops and other field work were kept, were not kept, only records of the alerts resulting in arrests were. Okay. And I take it you're prepared to sort of overcome that proposition. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Do you want to call a witness? Yes, Your Honor. All right. So let me just ask uh, Ms. Connors, what are you going to do? Are you going to? You're the questioner. You're the questioner. Okay, all right, sir. Thank you. You have a seat. Um, then, ma'am, come on up to the podium first. Please. You're going to ask questions soon, right? Yeah, so you want to stand there, and then you want to call your witness, and then we'll have a come over here to the bailiff. We'd like to call our witness, Deputy Dog. Ma'am, come on over. Um, you're going to have a mock oath administered. Okay? If this were a real case, we'd just swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You have a seat. I have a feeling you're not going to talk loud, so I need you to do that, okay? Because we'll have to do it all over again if you don't. So, all right, she's going to ask the questions, and I'm sure Mr. Jess will ask questions, and maybe even the court, so be ready. All right, go ahead. Would you please state your name to the court? Deputy Dog, D-A-W-G. All right. How long have you been working for the Wayne County Police Department? <coughs> Five years. Do you have any past experience in the field? Yes, I worked in Murraysville for three years and before that, Pittsburgh for two years. All right. So what were your jobs there? In Murraysville, I was a canine unit, and in Pittsburgh, I was a street cop. Do you have any other special certifications? Yes, I'm certified as a police officer for 10 years, and I also have a certification in drug recognition expert. Do you have any training working with canine drug dogs specifically? Yes, I have been certified with three different dogs on multiple occasions. Three different dogs, what? On multiple occasions. On multiple occasions, okay. So how long have you and Aldo been partnered? For about one and a half years. How long has he been a drug canine? Since he was about nine months old. Okay. Does Aldo have any other specific certifications? Yes, he's been certified once in 2012 for narcotics detection and again in 2013. 
Does he have any other special training? Yeah, he passed a scent discrimination test for scent discrimination tracking certification in 2013 and also again in 2014. All right, so with that previous information, how long since Aldo was last certified? It's been 15 months. He was certified last March. So how long would you say that those certifications and narcotic detections typically last? About one year. So would you say that the fact that he hasn't been certified for one year um, affect your dog's performance in any way? No, not at all. So how often in your experience would you say that Aldo falsely alerts? Probably once or twice since I've been with him. So how often in your experience would you say that Aldo correctly alerts? Uh, almost always. Alright. So on the day in question, what were you doing before the traffic stopped? We were on a routine traffic patrol. What caused you to pull the specific vehicle over? Her passenger back tail light was out. Okay, can you describe the suspect's behavior for me? She seemed visibly nervous. She could not sit still. She was shaking and breathing rapidly. Okay, so given the observations, what did you conclude? I figured she may have been on something that she shouldn't have been or that she was either sick. That she was what? Sick. <laughs> so what did you do next? I asked for her the identification, insurance, and registration information. Okay, so when gathering that information, what did you find when you ran the suspect's name? I saw that she had a uh, past record, including possession and uh, assault. Okay, given that information, what did you conclude? That there was a chance that her behavior was drug related. Did you request to search the vehicle? I did. What happened next? She denied it. So I brought Aldo out for a free air sniff. Okay. So could you just scratch the court what a free air sniff is? Uh, I just want to bring Aldo from the car and just walk him around. What I want to search to see if he smells anything. Do you always bring Aldo to conduct a free air sniff? Yes. What did you do with Aldo when he arrived on the scene? I walked him around the vehicle and he started to sniff around and then hit on the driver's side door. Okay. Could you describe to the court what hit on the car door means? He'll sit in front and then he'll paw at where he thinks the drugs are located. So you're saying that he indicated to you with pawing, correct? Yes. All right. So how long was it from when Aldo arrived on the scene that he hit on the car door? About one or two minutes. What did you conclude from this information? That I, based on the totality of the circumstances and the suspect's behavior, and Aldo indicating that there were drugs in the car, that I had enough probable cause to search the vehicle. Okay. What did you do once you retrieved Aldo from the car? What did you do from there on out after you Oh, I didn't it? search the vehicle. All right. So when you searched the vehicle, what did you find? 200 pseudoephedrine pills and 8,000 matches and a backpack. Wait, right. 200 pseudoephedrines and what else? 8,000 matches and a backpack. When you found the backpack, did you look inside? Yes. What did you find? I also found some paint thinner, iodine crystals, brake cleaner, battery acid, and red phosphorus. Would you say that it's normal to have those materials in such quantities? No. In your experience, those materials that you listed, what are they used for? Usually manufacturing and making methamphetamines. And you came to this conclusion how? Based on my experience and with my drug recognition being an expert in it. All right. We have no further questions. Okay. Um, Mr. Jess. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> you testified in drug examination that although this month has been your partner for a year and a half. Yes. And that he was certified once in that year and a half, right? Yes. Um, Fifteen months ago. Yes. So you only certified him once. So far, yes. Prior to this, you were certified him one time 15 months before him. Yes. So you've known him for 18, three months later you've certified him, and in 15 months you've done nothing with him to certify him. Yeah. In complete violation of all your training, right? Yeah. And then you have a lot of experience, apparently, with three different dogs over the years. Yes. And you said, I think on direct examination, you always do these free air steps. Yes. Okay. You always, um, and obviously you violated your department policy by not having were you subject to any discipline for that? No. Not yet? Or not, not yet. at all? Not yet. Okay. Um, 
you testified in direct examination that uh, um, he was only been falsely alerted once or twice, correct? Since I've been with him, yes. Okay. Well, where's that in your records? I don't know. Where you don't keep that in your records, do you? Not really. You, the only thing you put in your records is the positive ones. Yes. Right? Yes. So you violate your training as far as record keeping, too. I guess I did. Well, you went to training, right? Yes. Don't they tell you to keep records on both false alerts and positive alerts? Yes. So you violate your training. Yes. And you violate, again, the department policy. Yes. Have you subject to discipline for that? No, I haven't received any. Do you expect to be disciplined for it? Probably. Okay. You testified in direct examination that uh, when you approached the car, the uh, driver was nervous. Marijuana, marijuana was nervous. Yes. Uh, could not sit still, was shaking, breathing rapidly. How many car stops have you done in your career? Probably over 100. 100? How often do you walk up to somebody and they're not nervous? I mean, everyone seems nervous because no one likes to get pulled over. Yeah, a lot of people are nervous, I imagine, anxious. Yeah. More to do whatever you tell them to do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not a surprise that she said she's nervous. No. You also testified that you thought, you came to two conclusions based on her uh, possible conclusions, right? Yes. One was that she was either sick yes. or that she was using um, some substance. Yes. And uh, you're a DRE expert. Yes. And uh, you're an expert in uh, DUIs. Trained on DUIs, no? Yes. Okay. So uh, you didn't bother to ask, are you sick? No, not at that time. Not before you brought the dog out and searched the car, right? No. You never asked, according to the report. No. So one of your two hypotheses was either she was sick or she was on something. Yes. Possible that she was on a, a, a controlled substance that was prescribed to her, too, right? Yes. She didn't ask that question either, did you? No. You immediately assumed she was on an illegal substance and brought her dog out. Yeah. Your untrained, uncertified dog. Yeah. And again, you said you brought all the dogs to the car and this mutt pawed at the door. Yeah. Okay. But you didn't find anything at the door, did you? No. You didn't find anything near the door, did you? No. In fact, the only thing you found was in the backpack in the back seat, right? Yeah. Nowhere near where she pawed. So your untrained, uncertified dog, misalerted on this vehicle too. Yeah. And he's not qualified to get certified, has no training in finding the substance uh, pseudofedrin, right? That's right. Okay. And based on that, you think the search was good? Yes. Okay. Nothing further, huh? Okay. Thanks, sir. And let's see. Are we? Oh, I guess that would give you an opportunity to ask any additional questions that you're going to conclude. Is that correct? Okay, so any other questions there? Okay. When you approached the vehicle and she was visibly nervous, when you ran her information, what did you find when you collected her insurance and her ID? That she had multiple drug possessions, assault, neglect of her children, and abuse of animals. So, given the circumstances, do you believe that a reasonable person would have concluded that maybe she was possibly on drugs? Yes. Further questions time. And Mr. Joseph. Sorry, I'll just be brief. Yeah. I think you just testified that based on the um, criminal history of my client, may quote if I quote the DA, maybe possibly she was on drugs. Yes. Um, in your legal training, and, and I'm certain you've had some in MPOETC and throughout your career, is that a, a term that you're used to when you're considering because probable cause is what you need to search, right? Yes. Since you didn't have consent? Yes. Maybe possibly. Is that anywhere close to probable cause? Is that a legal term of any kind, maybe possibly? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, and you step down. Thank you. And do you close the agreements? No. Yes. Come on up. So here's the deal. Mr. Jess, in cross-examination, called your police canine dog untrained, uncertified mutt. And you want to convince the court that there is reason to use the search and that you had probable cause. Are you buying that? It's a highly certified police dog, Your Honor. To say that it is uncertified is... Was he not uncertified? He was uncertified at that point in time in narcotics. He was certified in scent discriminatory training. He still could smell. He was still very good at his job. He, they had routine practice. It's not like the dog had gone 13 months 
since there had been a stop. The dog had been actively training. Simply because it doesn't have a certification at that time doesn't mean the dog cannot smell anything at all. Is there a reason to have a certification? Though? At this time, I do not know. It would be something that we would need to investigate. It could have been because of an increased police load. There could have been problems with just the logistics of I'm just wondering why is there a certification required whatsoever? Because it's important to every so often double check that the dogs from another person other than a, their trainer can in fact do their job. Okay. All right, and go ahead, let's, let's hear your argument as to why we should uh, rule that the uh, evidence comes in. The accuracy of a canine has always been questioned. You've been given the facts of the case where deputy dog stopped the defendant, although did not go inside the vehicle. This event could have happened in anywhere. It could have happened in a parking lot, on the road. It could have, there's no special, it just, um, they have had past training, past experience with each other, so it is reasonable that when this dog indicates that there is drugs, that the trainer, deputy dog, would have suspicions of drugs there. And with his past training and all of the other facts, the totality of the circumstances, a reasonable person would conclude the same. Okay, you're on. That all right, thank you, sir. And Mr. Kesson, do you agree with the problem? No, sir. Did you call him up? I did. I did. All right. Um, all right, so here's the deal. And in terms of the, um, uh, I think there's some significant problems with the dog, potentially with his pattern, with the fact that it was an uncertified uh, dog. And so the court would need to see uh, whether or not the certification um, makes that a circumstance where we shouldn't consider the dog in any way and then we'll be forced to look at what other things were known to um, to officer dog uh, in determining whether there was probable cause. So the court will rule on that to catch matter. We ready to go? Are we done? You missing anything? No. Unless Mr. Jess wants to make a motion for bail. Oh. One of the circumstances, Your Honor, that you're probably going to conclude fairly easily that this dog's uncertified and untrained obviously hit on something they're not qualified to do. We're asking for a bail reduction. Uh, while you consider, uh, we can certainly have non-bail or non-monetary restrictions. As you know, uh, Wheaton County has uh, pretrial services, and my client can uh, be better served outside of jail than in. Do you know what his bail is at this point? I don't, Your Honor. Okay. Call off one. Respond? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. To say that there weren't drugs there is there could have been drugs there in the past simply because there weren't drugs when Aldo hit at that point does not mean that the defendant didn't have those drugs that it is certified in at a previous date. But we believe that bail should not be lowered because the defendant is in fact a flight risk. She has run from facing charges before. She has had multiple assaults in her past record and several um, other convictions. We believe she is a danger to the community and it would be best for her and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania if she remained in custody for the time being. Do you think it's proper for the court to consider bail based on the likelihood of conviction? In other words, if the evidence is stronger that the person is going to be convicted, is that a factor that would make bail tend to make bail higher? No, Your Honor. Or no. Yes, Your Honor. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So if if you if there's some weakness to your search and the chance of the conviction goes down, should I also reduce the bail at this point? No, Your Honor, you should. The bail should be changed depending on whether or not you believe there's a flight risk of the defendant. And of course, you notice that she may be a flight risk. So at this yes, point, uh, we'll uphold the bail as stated. All right? Yes, Your Honor. Push it. All right. It Post. is. Um, we just conclude by uh, asking if you have any comments, either you or Mr. Jess, about the... Am I doing that? <laughs> Come on the mics. I don't want to Not mine, though, right? No. Okay, good. Is <laughs> that right on anyone? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Or allowing comments. the students to ask questions also. Any, let's start with that. Do, you, do any of the students have questions? I'll ask you a question. I just like when I ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible, isn't it? Yes. A little different. 
Oh yeah, that's exactly what happened. You have all of this stuff right now, and somebody just goes boom. And, and I thought Nathan did a very good yeah, job yeah. of uh, responding, even though you threw him off script right. uh, and started by asking questions, and that that, that can happen. Um, and you did a very good job. You answered the questions that the judge asked. You plus, listened. You. Thought plus, about it's really it. bad when you're like, oh, I do have an uncertified, untrained mind. And you still have to argue the position that you don't. I thought that was good. Not, not, not politically correct. <laughs> the dog is a police officer. You should have objected and said he's a highly trained, not a mind. Yes. Sir. So I was, uh, as I was listening, I was listening to a lot of policies that were uh, that may have been broken in the mock trial. And so I was wondering, does that often happen? Um, like with, with the woman who touched the, the man's hand in order to talk to him and things along those lines. Do those policies often get broken in? Um, Cases. You want to answer? Yeah, I think all the time. Yeah. We set of rules, and then when people don't follow the rules, you have to figure out, you know, whether the outcome was sort of tainted. Yeah, it's, I mean, the more the you follow. It's the procedure that that's protected by the Constitution, which is going to keep you keep you safe. It keeps the government from overreaching. So. Um, Good to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the fact that it happens and there is a procedure to challenge it is. Right. Like, you know, there's a rule. Like, you guys have to leave like in three minutes because a lot of you, I know the professor has to be somewhere at one, and probably all of us do. But, like, when there's a rule that says, like, if there is a rule that talks about the lineup, it says one guy should prepare the lineup, someone else should present it. If you just said, oh, the cops are always honest, they never do anything wrong, you would just go and you would have, you wouldn't have to have any of these procedures. But it just makes more sense when you say, as a matter of policy, that the person who presents the picture shouldn't even know. And when that happens, and if that's the case, um, it makes it look like a much cleaner identification. Except that when um, Ms. Bird is stuck with the fact that she had some conversation or that, what's his name, Fife and the other guy have some conversation, it makes it look like someone saying, you're gonna have lunch at six? Or, you know, what, how many children do you have, six? Like, you know, so there's that opportunity to, to, you know, pollute the, the game a little bit. Any other questions? This is exactly what happens. You get up, attorneys have, they spend all night thinking about what they're gonna do, and then the judge just goes, that's not what I want you to know. No, I want to ask about this, or I want to ask about that, and you're like, good, 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 good. And it's always people are like, oh, that's a question I didn't want to answer, because <laughs> that's my weakest. And you're like, yeah, that's the problem, you know. I thought okay. you did a good job addressing it on, on yeah. your direct examination. You brought it out. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, Mr. Jess was going to bring it out. And you right. lose credibility then with the judge. Right. It really seems like so much of this is just like thinking on the fly. <laughs> you and, think? Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, what do you say? Do you think? You think? <laughs> is, is there like a method that you use, or is it just kind of your own personal thing that you, you can't do it? You have to do corporate law. That's kind of how it is. You get either. Great wills. <laughs> what did you say? Great wills. Great wills. I mean, it's sort of either you're either going to be. Is there is there a method? Yeah, the method is to really, really, really understand the law, because you can't do anything with the facts, but you really do need to understand the law and to realize that the stuff that we're talking about right now is exactly if you if they gave you a badge and said here's how you turn on the light and they had you driving around, this is exactly all you would know at this point. And you would say, oh, I don't know if they did this wrong or they did that wrong, because I don't even know what they did. But if you could at least say, this is what a DUI is, these are the requirements of the elements of possession, this is what was required for a search, and, and the best you could do is to really, really know the rules, so that when somebody, when you're on your feet, you're not at least thinking, oh, I need to Google this or that. And with, the more you do it, and the more you realize why the rule is there, the more it is that you're able to be, you know, not necessarily, you're not making it up as you go, you're, you're kind of like trying to fit it to, fit the facts to the law. And sometimes what happens is the prosecution will say, oh, I know the rule, I'll withdraw the charges. Sometimes that happens in the middle of a hearing, because you're not supposed to be just trying to get a conviction, you're supposed to, and they do, seek justice. Isn't that great? I thought you were all well prepared as usual, I don't want to hold you up. I agree with you. It's hard once the judge starts asking you questions and knocks you off your game. <laughs> and you know, these fact patterns aren't going to benefit to either one, of the, either one of the groups. They're hard. Right. They, sorry, question for you. Um, 
how do you get your questions? When the Commonwealth is sitting there making their case, do you go, ooh, I can get them on that? Or how does it kind of formulate in your head? Sure, you want to know what, we, as the judge said, you know what the law is. Right. You know what the facts are in general. And uh, so you're waiting, sitting there saying, oh, wait, wait a minute, that's not what they said before in the report. Or um, that's something that, that I can jump on and say, well, wait a minute, that's not usual. Okay. But you have to know, as the judge said, what, what is normal. Okay. Right. And cross examination isn't. Direct examination is prepared and it's practiced and right. it's it's anticipated. Cross examination is really on your feet. Right. Um, you you know something about the case and you know the normal and you know the law, but you don't know what this witness is going to testify to. So, uh, you know, Mr. Jess comes in with a yeah, I'm guessing comes in with I know comes in with a game plan or strategy, but that is going to shift depending on what that witness. Tells. Right. Much so, like you had to do on direct examination or redirect. Examination. Sometimes all you could do is, you know, you say you're a police officer, you want to solve a case, you're you're sympathetic to victims. You ask them all that stuff that they have to agree, and then you try to make the jump that okay, because of that, not that you're a bad guy, but you're, there's so much pressure on you to solve this case that you it would be bad for the police department if you didn't have somebody, wasn't there? And you know, one of these guys with a long beard did something wrong here, and. Don't you think it would be, wouldn't it be a bad mistake if we picked the wrong person? Yeah. So wouldn't you want Mr. Fife to make sure we got the wrong person? Oh, 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 you know, that kind of thing. I just have to say, I'm really surprised, Mr. Jess, when Ms. Bird testified, and I have it in quotes, um, all, all innocent pe they're all innocent people in my eyes. I know you had to let that go, because that was so you to jump on. In fact, I think you looked at me and <laughs> That was a gift from Mr. Chesney. Hey, I always enjoy these things, and I certainly don't want to delay you guys. You all have to be somewhere. I appreciate the fact that we got it done. So Thank, you, Thank you, Mr. Chesney. Thank you.